Hey everyone, Wolflord Row here. So we have reached our latest Primarch week, and Magnus the Red Week begins today. It was a tough decision to make between Mortarion or Magnus for this week's special. But fret not fans of the Death Lord, for if the channel hits 90k subscribers, for the next Primarch week special, it will be Mortarion. However, on to today, and today we are discussing the relationship between Magnus and his brother Perturabo, and how it wasn't just the Emperor of Mankind who tried to save Magnus from himself. Spoiler warning to begin, the events we are discussing today are from the Horus Heresy Primarch series novel Magnus the Red, Master of Prospero by Graham McNeil. As always, I really recommend you read the story for yourself first, as that's the best way to enjoy the lore for yourself. Not only that, we help to support the Great Games Workshop and Black Library, because without them, we don't have this amazing lore to talk about. I will put a link in the description as always. But with that said, let's just jump straight in. So as always, with our Primarch Weeks, the aim is to take a deep dive into the mind of the Primarch, and truly get a grasp of not only how and why Magnus's story unfolded the way it did, but to gain an understanding of just what makes him tick. And where better to begin than with the Great Crusade? Now during the course of this particular novel, we get to see a joint campaign between the Thousand Sons and the Iron Warriors Legion. And it's one of the unique moments in history that a world is graced by the presence of not only two legions at the same time, but two Primarchs with them. And it's during this meeting that we get to see a true bond of brotherhood between the two brothers. As the Thousand Suns transport approaches the Iron Warriors encampment, a vast fortress citadel, the Sons of Magnus can't help but marvel at the worksmanship of their Iron Warrior cousins. Even more so when Magnus reveals it's been carved from the very cliff face all within one day. The Iron Warriors certainly live up to their reputation. And in true Magnus style, he claims to his marvelling sons that the Thousand Sons could of course do better. And there's an interesting moment where Magnus gives them a curious look, seemingly wondering why his sons aren't so utterly convinced in themselves as he is. The Thousand Sons certainly share their father's confidence, but clearly not to the point of it being their dominant trait. Upon landing, the Thousand Sons are greeted by an Iron Warrior welcoming committee, led of course by Perturabo himself. And as the breath catches in the throat of the Thousand Sons, at the sight of the Lord of Iron, the two Primarchs greet each other warmly. So visually different, one a flamboyant, extravagant giant with a flowing mane of red hair, the other an immovable mountain, a literal lord of metal. None would expect, out of all the Primarchs for them to share any kinship with, this would perhaps be their most cherished relationship. And yet it is. Beneath their vastly different exteriors, the two brothers share many inherited traits from their father, the Emperor of Mankind, a love of art and a passion for gaining knowledge. It's from this sibling love that Perturabo, in his way, will seek to warn his brother. Once the greeting has finished, their meeting moves on inside the citadel, and Magnus introduces his sons to Perturabo's senior warsmiths, including his senior librarius. And this raises the eyebrows of Perturabo, 
asking Magnus if he's sure that's still a good idea. Now this is a long time before the Council of Nikea, but it's very clear here, the use of librarians was always a controversial subject at the very best. And Magnus here, as expected, remains his usual confident self, simply stating he does, and that Sanguinius agrees with him too. Apparently, even in the earlier days of the Crusade, where only 12 Primarchs have been found at this point, Sanguinius' name carries some weight. And side notes here, but man, we need to be given more Crusade era Sanguinius. I've said this countless times on the channel before, but show us why Sanguinius is so loved and respected. Show us more of the angel before all the foreboding of the heresy. But I digress. After throwing out Sanguinius' name in his defence, Magnus appears to heed his brother's warning. However, there is an extremely interesting line. I will do as you advise, and temper my researches with caution, replied Magnus. And Atava felt the lightest brush of psychic influence from his Primarch. So subtle, he was unsure if he'd felt it at all. Now this is absolutely fascinating, because it's not his sons that Magnus is directing his power at here, but his brother Perturabo. Now Perturabo as a Primarch is obviously above being able to be swayed by Magnus's power, but that's not what Magnus is trying to do. He's not trying to change his brother's mind, merely to move on and change the subject. An attempt to make him accept his words at face value. That is why it's so subtle. A little nudge in the right direction to make Perturabo take it as sincere. If Magnus tried anything stronger or more obvious, then Perturabo would have obviously detected it. He may not be the most renowned psychic of all the Primarchs, but all of the Primarchs have some kind of psychic ability. So Magnus truly had to be subtle in his efforts here. A simple little moment like this truly shows just how long Magnus was treading down the wrong path. It may have been a few small steps at this point, but as we know, every journey begins with but a single step, and in having to risk attempting using his powers towards one of his own brothers, who's simply offering his concern, it certainly makes it hard to argue that Magnus was anything but his own worst enemy. However, Magnus follows on that they get back to business, and they discuss their campaign upon the world before once more returning to personal matters. Magnus promises to be at the unveiling of a grand amphitheatre Perturabo is designing, upon the throne world of terror. And again, it's reinforced of the clear bond and love between the two brothers, of how they had spent hours upon terror together, trying to find and discover ancient relics and artefacts, which again makes it all the more saddening that Magnus is already having to try and hide his true intent from the ones that care for him and that he cares for the most. Perturabo then unveils a small device called the Antikythera, a replica he has made at Magnus's request. He's not sure if it works, as Magnus never explained to him what it was truly for. And Magnus, as cryptic and evasive as ever, merely replies, well, you built it, what do you think it does? Perturabo believes it to be for navigation, similar to the sextant instruments used by sailors of old. So he asks his brother, just what ocean would he be seeking to use it on? The Great Ocean, said Magnus. 
it allows even those without our gifts to perceive the realm beyond. Perturabo nodded and set down the Antikythera. I suspected as much, he said with a sigh, turning to lift something heavy from another part of his workbench. You remember what our father told us in the Hall of Leng, when he spoke of the warp and the danger of looking too deeply into its heart. I do, said Magnus, but this has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with that, as well you know, but we will speak of this later. Perturabo's arm swung around, and he smashed the delicate mechanisms of the Antikythera with a heavy hammer. The metal of the device buckled and split, the precision ground lenses shattering into a thousand fragments. Brother, no, cried Magnus, as the pieces fell to the floor. Why? Perturabo replaced the hammer on his workbench and said, Because I will play no part in aiding you, in delving into things you have been told to leave well alone. Our father knows more than us. He has seen further than us. If he tells us there are regions of the warp into which even he does not dare look, then we are beholden to accept that. Magnus stared at the ruined device in disbelief. Such a piece was the work of a master, a treasure that ought to have been held up as the epitome of the craftsman's art. Knowing what you suspected, you could have destroyed the Antikythera at any time after its completion, said Magnus with cold and controlled anger. But you waited until I was here to see you do it. Why? Because you needed to see it destroyed, to truly understand. Magnus let out a breath. You have a cruel streak in you, brother, he said. Perhaps, conceded Perturabo, but sometimes cruelty is the only way to make a point so clearly that nobody can ever mistake its intent. Now, upon first reaction here, Perturabo comes across as the bad guy, maliciously destroying this artifact right in front of Magnus. However, you shouldn't mistake Perturabo's intent. This is again the Primarch of Olympia trying to warn his brother to stop him against following a path their father has warned them against. His raising on Olympia may have ingrained a harsher existence into him than Magnus's on the world of Prospero. However, Perturabo's heart is very much in the right place. There is a reason the Emperor warned them against peering too deep into the warp. Magnus needs to listen to that for his own good. And let's be real here, if Magnus truly thought he was in the right, if he had no reservations about his own actions, then why did he not tell Perturabo what the device was for from the very beginning? Because he knew Perturabo would object, because he knew it was wrong. Once again, it's an insight into Magnus. The biggest reason for his downfall was always going to be himself. He ignored the warning of his father. He ignored the warnings of his closest brothers. He ignored the warnings of his own sons. Always utterly and completely convinced he was in the right. Right up until the moment it all came crashing down. If you haven't read The Master of Prospero, guys, I really do recommend it. It's a fascinating bit of character study into the mind of Magnus, the subtle steps he takes towards his eventual doom. Heedless of the many efforts by those that care about him to just think twice. He simply can't fight his own nature that lust for further knowledge. 
the relationship and interplay between himself and Perturabo, as I said earlier, is truly fascinating and at times heartwarming. So often we see Primarch rivalries coming to the fore, but here, it's a true example of the Brotherhood that can very much exist between the Primarchs. The truest example of the family that can exist between them. Vastly different, yet still so similar. United by blood and bonded by calls. It's a friendship the two would take, even into the heresy and the siege of terror itself. Such a shame they would both end up on the side of the traitors. If anything here, it's inconceivable Perturabo would fall. But can we say the same for Magnus? It almost feels inevitable. But as always, guys, what do you think? Are you surprised at the bond between Magnus the Red and Perturabo? Two Primarchs so different on the surface, yet so similar on the inside. Was the meaning of Perturabo's warning lost in his execution of the message? Does the harsh manner of the Lord of Iron negate the point of his meaning? And was Magnus always his own worst enemy? Was there ever a part of him that could truly listen to the words of his brothers? To the words of his father? Could he really have been saved from walking down this path? Or was it always going to end only one way? As always, leave your thoughts in the comments below. I love to read them. Huge thank you to all my subscribers. Your support truly means a lot to me. It really does. And if you're new, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. And if you enjoyed this particular vid, then why not drop a like on it too? But with that said, I am off. And I will be back tomorrow as Magnus Week continues.